This is Dave Arnold, your host of Cooking Issues, coming to you live from the heart of Manhattan, Rockefeller Center, New York City, Newsstand Studios. Joined uh, with only, actually, it's only you and me today in the studio, Joe. Joe Hazen. How you doing? Doing all right. Uh, John's feeling uh, under the under the weather, so he's uh, staying home tonight, you know. Sorry for you, John. Yeah, or today. Yeah, sorry, too. Uh, hopefully he'll be back uh, next week. Uh, joined in the upper left hand by Quinn. How you doing? Hey, I'm good. Good. Uh, not in Los Angeles. We ha- Well, actually, let's do Los Angeles first. I think, Jack, you are in Los Angeles now, correct? You're back? Yes, yes. I am here. We have Mr. Molecules there, and then headed all the way back over to almost New York, but not quite. We have Nastasia the Hammer Lopez. How you doing, Stas? I'm good. Back on our coast again. Awesome. And, and to make up for the fact that we don't have John... Very, very special, uh, long time, uh, old, old time cooking issues friend of show, Jordana Rothman. How you doing? So good. I'm happy to be here, John, today, baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, as long as it starts with a, with a J, we need two J's on every show. So that's how it goes. Um, yeah. there you go. Hey, before I start, that's the joke. everyone here but Quinn has at one point at least lived in New York City. Is it just New York people that think that they can spout off at you at random as they're, like, speeding by and not have you yell back at them? Or is that everyone everywhere and it's just there's more people in New York? I don't understand you- the question. Like, I'm, on, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a, first of all, like, when you're on a bike, in New, in New York, there's, there's, a, there's a rage situation between pedestrians and both bikers and drivers. And there's a rage situation between bike, there's a rage situation between all three people at all times, infinite rage between all three groups directed against the other two groups, no matter which group you're in, right? But today, Mm -hmm. I'm on the bike, right? On a city bike, which is, by the way, slow. I mean, you know, I make it go as fast as I can, but it's slow. So I zip up to the thing, and then I've got my hands on the brake. Anyone with eyes can see I've got my hands on the brake. I'm stopping because it's a red light, and I always stop. To be- and a guy on a bike who's meandering around without a helmet, right, tells me I need to slow down and stop because it's a red light for pedestrians. I'm like, so, and he thinks he can just say that and, and go on. I'm like, sir, one, you're not a pedestrian. You're on a bicycle. Two, you're weaving around. Three, I am stopping. Here I am stopped. And then he starts going, and then I'm like, have a nice day. He flips me, uh, uh, he, he yells something back at me. I look at him, and I go, oh, and by the way, you're, I yell at him. I was like, my brother, you're driving the wrong way up a one-way street with you and you're talking. You and you're talking are going the wrong way up a one-way street. And he flicks me off. So I give the loudest have a nice day I've ever given in my life. Like, such a loud have a nice day. And they, even the crossing yeah. guard was like, yep. That guy's a jerk. But is that a New York thing that people think they can, like, with, without repercussions, start talking to people that no one's going to spout back at them, or what? This sounds like an extremely New York story. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do feel like, no, I, I do have a lot of thoughts. On the one hand, I think that you did start the story by saying that the bike is slow. That does feel a little bit like a blame the equipment situation. Well, but that should be in my favor because I should be going slow. You should be like, oh, this person's not a threat. They're, they're on the equivalent of a potato bug for a bicycle. You know what I'm saying? Sure, sure. I mean, sure. that should be in my favor. If you see a potato bug coming, even a pedestrian can get out of the way of a potato bug. Here's the thing. We're all just doing our best. You know what I mean? That's the thing. I don't think this guy was doing his best. I think this guy thought he could vent his anger about his life and, like, what a cesspool his life is, Right. On right. somebody else without repercussion. Answer is you can't do that. The whole reason New York sucks to live in is because you have to absorb and absorb and absorb and not give off. You know what I'm saying? And once you give off, you have to get it back. That's what, that's the whole thing here. It's hard to live there. That one of the perks of living there is that you get to take out your aggression on strangers. That's literally in the charter. That's I, why you do it. No, no, no. That's the kind of person who hits people in the head with bricks. You can't do that. Like, it's about absorbing and swallowing all of your rage. If, 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 if everyone, if all eight million of us let go and, th- like, imagine, imagine, ima- w- imagine a- Wild West. I mean, thank God there's air conditioning in most places here. You know what I mean? Mm, thank God. I mean, thank God. I told you that's my theory about the Wild West, right? Everyone's like, oh, why did everyone get shot in the Wild West? It's not because there's no law. It's because there's no air conditioning. Imagine if people are getting into arguments and it's 120 degrees outside. 
it's so much easier just to shoot somebody. You know what I mean? I do feel weird about this conversation. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyways, uh, if you're listening live on Patreon, call your questions to uh, 917-410-1507. That's 917-410-1507. And uh, if they want to be on the Patreon, Quinn, uh, what should they do and why should they do it? Uh, They should go to patreon.com slash cooking issues. You get the uh, show early. You get prioritized answers to your questions. You get to join the Discord where... A bunch of nerds continue talking about this stuff at any hour of the day, including illustrious guests like uh, Kevin from Noma. Yeah. So yeah. it's a pretty fun chat room. Yeah, and uh, sp- speaking of people who are going to be guests, we're going to have uh, Edward Poe from Edward's Aids, Ed- Edward's Aged Meats in about uh, a month. So start gathering all of your aged meat questions. Um, mm hmm. I had something else. Uh, oh, yeah. Also, uh, from the Patreon, a shout out to Mad Sushi. Now, we're having a discussion internally whether listener Mad Sushi is angry about sushi or likes Mad Sushi, a.k.a. lots of sushi. What do you guys think? Or it's like, it has to be a lot. A lot? Yeah. Like, you can't yeah. think, like, I'm mad about sushi. You know what I mean? Well, right. oh, I see, like, right. ma- mad about Harry kind of thing. He's, he's just wild about me, that kind of situation. Oh, that's interesting. I was yeah. thinking more of like Paul Riser, Helen Hunt. Oh, mad about you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, you know what? That was a good show, but I didn't watch it. Did you watch that show? You know, I, I think I was like a little young for it. But yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, so I was assuming Mad Sushi was like, could be a combination of mad as in slang for a little bit baddie. And also, like, lots of, and could be pulling a piven, like, maybe eats so much tuna, like, like pretends that the reason that they're violent towards others is because of mercury poisoning. You know what I mean? That's probably it. Yeah. 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 Probably I, it. I think there was someone recently who tried the piven defense, like, also did something unconscionable and tried to piven their way out of it by, like, too much tuna, too much tuna. And I have to say... Even though I tell Booker that he's going to die from mercury poisoning because of all of the freaking tuna heats, can after can after can after can after can, after can. like, uh, I mean, he doesn't seem any more or less mercury poisoned than he did before, although please don't tell him that because I have no brakes on the tuna machine if, if, if that happens. Boy, it's only fish. Only fish. It's crazy. Uh, anyway. Only fish. Only fish. Uh, only, fi- he- only fish. Only yeah. fish and for lovers. <laughs> only what? Only fans for aquarium lovers. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, see, he eats, what does he eat? I tried to branch out, so the other day I bought uh, skate. You know, I love cooking skate because you can just beat the ever-loving crap out of it, and it still tastes good. You know what I mean? It's the fish that you can hammer real hard, and it still tastes good. I don't like it if it's under. You guys, don't, I don't like skate when it's under, though. You guys, what, what do you guys think? Skate wing? Yeah, I don't like when an undercooked on- skate wing. I don't like an undercooked skate yeah. wing. Skate wing is one of those things that it gives me... Well, what is the name of that thing that people feel when they like look at coral reefs or like mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. beehives? It's, um, it's, you know, we're thinking... Wait, wait, hold you on. Know. I don't understand. Like beehives, I'm trying to get what the thing is between the two. You mean, is this a visual thing or like are you afraid of coral or do you love looking at beehives? Because when I think of coral reefs, I think beauty and wonder. Well, you know, that's great for you. I am talking about me. Yeah, um, yeah. But there's like a sensation that you get that some people get when they look at things that have like a lot of holes in them, it's like a phobia. Huh. And it's like, it's for a reef or be hot, like certain things that like make your skin crawl. It's like a, I don't know, it's like an evolution thing that predators had lots of eyes. I don't fucking yeah, yeah, know. Yeah. Something like that. Okay, but, I have not heard um, of this. This is interesting. What about sponges? Same. Yeah, there's like a sim. It can be a similar thing, and I think that I don't know, skate kind of does that to me a little. All the lines, you, know, you mean? The, all the lines? Yeah, uh, like the fan out. There's no, something like about it. Huh. Yeah. What about like the hammer open bird wings, like a soaring eagle? No, I'm into that. That makes me feel wild and free. All right. Okay. Yeah. What about skates when they're alive un- under the water? They look kind of cool. That's okay because you can't really see the lines. They look kind of more just like big fans. Then right. You know what? I don't have any 
firsthand experience to say, but I, but I do, I see what you're saying. And I, and I want to say that I would be experiencing on wonder if I yeah. saw a skate under, under yeah. the, under the sea. I mean, they just look like rays, but like, not like cool colors. You know what I mean? They look like whatever. Yeah. Anyway, but the point is, here's something weird about uh, skates. Did you know that until recently, I'm sure you did, that they were considered trash fish and people would throw them away and that, uh, one thing that they used to say they would do, which I can't believe because they don't taste at all similar, is that they would make fake scallops out of them. So they would take the center, the, the closer to the center portions, the thicker portions of the skate wing, so not the part that you're afraid of. And they would stamp circles out of it as though they were scallops and sell them as fake scallops. But it doesn't make any sense because they don't have the texture of scallops and they don't taste like scallops. So yeah. like, who's buying yeah. these as scallops? You know what I'm saying? Nobody knows what anything I can, like. I can kind of see the texture. Really? Like if you yeah. if you really hit the skate flesh hard, and then you're like, oh, sorry, I overcooked the scallops. But the fibers go uh, the yeah. wrong way. Well, it depends on which way you cut it, I guess. But the skate is thin. You can't cut a scallop. You can't. I, I don't. I don't see. Uh, you, are you saying like they cut? They cut little scallops. They cut it the other way. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Like bay scallops. They really. I mean, they get, really don't taste like bay scallops. Little, you can get little scallops. I mean, you know, listen, if, you, if you're buying little scallops, you better be buying them, like, in Nantucket, like, right off the freaking boat. Those things are damned delicious, right? Otherwise, you know, if you're buying, like, some tiny scallop that was shipped 8 billion miles and been, like, you know, festering in its own filth and, like, you know, treated with, like, all sorts of garbage to keep it from going bad and from losing all of its liquid, like, you know, not as nice. You know what I'm saying? But I guess you're buying fake scallops yeah. anyway, so who cares? You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe like an accessibility problem that is emerging from from that, but I do think that um, I don't know. Like people don't even realize that like imitation crab meat yeah. is not crab meat. You know, really? I, I don't. Oh, I like surimi. I use surimi all the time. I think surimi should be its own thing. I think you should stop calling it imitation <laughs> crab meat and and just call it California roll juice or something like this. You know what I mean? Do you not like surimi? I think surimi makes a good seafood salad. No, I'm. A judgment, a judgment call on surimi or imitation crab meat at all. My point is that from a consumer perspective, if, a cons- if plenty of consumers do not know that that is not crab meat mm. and are fine with that information, I think that there's an equally compelling case to be made that people who were or are buying stamped out scallops, imitation scallops made out of skate wings, probably don't know the difference and or care. Do you know well, what I'm saying? Well, I don't because I've never seen one of these I, things and neither of you because you said you didn't. Like, we don't even know what these things look like. It doesn't even make sense to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, at least the crab things are colored like crab. They don't look like crab to me, but I, I mean, I, in other words, I get some aspect of it, although, of course, you would imagine that crabs wouldn't grow their own flesh wrapped in plastic tubes, right? I mean, you would guess that, which I don't know why, that, I, I don't know why that stuff comes in plastic tubes. Piss, that, that ticks me off. Like, have you ever I had to do that? My- what? For, what is it, going on 30 years? I've been doing it. I've been farming it, and it's going really well, and I'm excited to, I'm excited for this new business. <laughs> Wait, what do you say? What, do you, what, what are you lying about farming for 30 years now? My own flesh. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Two. Oh, nice. You know, yeah. uh, I, you know, you were uncomfortable with the first segment of this show, and now you're taking us into cannibalism, which I appreciate because that has been a long time uh, topic that we haven't brought up in a long time. I don't feel it's time to bring back the would you eat your own arm situation if you had to or if you or, you know, if you had the opportunity to. I don't think it's time to bring that back yet. I don't think we should ever bring that it's back. Not- OK, I, I mean, sort of feel like I know. What you- I mean, I, you know, yeah. you know where I stand on it. I do. You know, I do know where you stand. Yeah. Don't let it go to waste. And it sounds like you're the same way. With, with all of the, you know, developments in lab-grown meat. Well, are there actually gonna... are there actually a lot of developments in lab-grown meat, or is that one of those things with a lot of hoo-ha? Well, I don't think it's a lot of hoo-ha. I'm pretty sure, like, a year ago, the FDA said that they don't even have to label it as lab-grown. If it's... I don't have to look at it. I, I know that there's someone who got their stuff passed, but that it's still far, far, far too expensive to actually make a dent in anything and it was mainly chicken but i don't know i i would totally eat lab grown you know you know i'm waiting for like lab grown uh whatever you know it's not that it's going to taste like the real thing it's like 
it's like I don't see how anytime soon you're going to make anything grown in a, like a monocultural situation taste, especially like. You know, everyone's so hyped up on the differences between even the different cows that they buy or the different pigs that they buy, eat the different chickens, all of the ways that they're raised, the, the impacts things have on flavor, the like uh, what the feed that goes into it. And then to think that you can monoculturally raise cells in a dish and then make that same flavor. Yeah, I mean, like someday, you know, someday, maybe I don't think anytime yeah, soon. But Dave, you're thinking about the high end too much. No, but the, the low the, end meat <laughs> is cheap. That's what my point is. is that if, if the lab-grown meat is going to cost 20 times as much as anything that we eat, which is going to for a while, then it better be, like, as good as the best stuff. It is a high-end proposition, right? There is no, right now, technology where we're going to feed the world fake lab-grown meat, and it's going to actually be more carbon-neutral and cheaper and better for the environment than what we're doing right now, right? Beef, maybe, because beef is such a, beef is such a bad proposition— from a from a um, an input standpoint, but not that's chicken, right? Not chicken, and that's the first one that they're that they're that they're doing. The chicken's the most efficient animal that we raise. I mean, there's lots of externalities that that you know aren't getting erased, but I'm sure there's going to be externalities in this other stuff as well. I mean, so in other words, like I think it's a false, I think it's a false thing to say. Oh, well, no, it's we're only shooting at the low end. Well, if, if it's really low end, then, you know, just buy Impossible, which is, uh, you know, a decent analog for low end beef, right? Um, Dave, I have a proposition for you. Uh-huh. Okay. Is your Patreon tiered? Yeah. It's tiered. Yeah. What's like the highest reward? I don't know. When? Uh, all access. Let me see the exact perks. All right, well, you look uh, into that, a proposition for an even higher tier. Okay, let's hear it. On the oh game ground. Okay, and here's what I'm thinking. Lab-grown Dave Arnold flesh. Mm. And mm. you sell it, and it's in Yakitori viewers. Mm -hmm. you, you go and Yakitori? <laughs> mm. I was well, that, that's more uh, Kushiyaki, because Yaki, I mean, Tori means bird. So. Okay. Oh, my gosh. So, you're Quinn. so particular, Quinn. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Um, really just, I love your yes and style. Um, Nastasia, what's the name of that barbecue thing that you and Mark used to have? Like little, oh, the twisty it, thing. Well, is that the Croatian speedies. thing? Oh, speedies. speedies, speedies, speedies. No. Oh, wait, he, wait, wait, you, you guys made speedies like, like Syracuse? Yeah. You did. You never came. You never come to any of this. Uh, don't lie. Yeah, I, like I, I went to that thing that you had outside at that hellhole outside uh, in the 40s with that cool, tiny, long grill with the little things that were like speedies. But he was doing some sort of Euro thing and he bought that grill from Euro trash people. Euro people. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, the point is. You I never go to any of my things. Crazy. The point is, is that I think the highest Patreon level is flesh of Dave Arnold. Grilled on the spiadini, the little tiny rotisseries, and it doesn't, but it doesn't speak. It's just flesh. Mm. <laughs> it's just meat. Mm. And, and you can choose, you can either have it vac packed and sent to you um, for your own, you know, for your own like Memorial Day barbecue, or whatever, or highest, highest level, Dave comes and cooks it himself. Well, thankfully, Memorial Day is over. Uh, well, but pe is people, this is, this is not, this is not real people. It's not real. Not real. It is real people. It's the FDA said that if it's on a cellular level, <laughs> you don't have to label it lab grown. So actually it is real people. It's oh, oh, I get it. I get it. I, I, uh, uh, I get you. I get you. All right. Let's, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's take a question while we're, while we're, uh, while we're <laughs> thinking about this from Tony, Tony, um, Okay, Tony Tony wants to know about uh, hex clad pans, right? Uh, is it is it for a home cook on a budget with a gas stove? Is the hex pan a good frying pan to buy? And I have to say, Tony, I've never, I've never used one. I don't own one, and I've never used one. If I was going to own, have, have any? Has anyone here owned one or used one? I have not, but I would say the sentiment from ninety percent of people is that they're bad. Okay, but you know, that's just the, that's the sentiment I'm 
<laughs> I mean, I'm sure Tony Tony can look in other people's sentiments, right? He wants to know someone who's actually used it. I haven't used it, but I'll say this. If you're going to buy a, a frying pan, uh, I really, the, like, if you look at, if I look at, all, I'm looking in my head at all my pans hanging over my stove right now, the two things that I go for most, right, and what I have are, uh, in regular rotation, I have cast iron, I have uh, black iron, you know, black iron thin, black, you know, black iron blue steel pan, I have, which are much lighter. Uh, I have uh, two sizes of Lincoln uh, Centurion, which are not all clad. They're disc bottom clad, very thick, right, uh, aluminum cladding pans, like extremely fast, extremely even with thin sides, right? And... Uh, an all, a couple of all clads, different sizes, old school, D3s. And what I reach for, and I have a, a nonstick, I have uh, one of those uh, green pans. I've never had a nonstick pan that I- has ever lasted. Let me put it that way. The green pan is now dented and dinged. My old scan pan's dented and dinged. I have never had a nonstick pan that has ever lasted for any length of time under the circumstances I put it through. It just hasn't happened. So what I reach for probably most often are the Centurion and the black uh, iron. I reach only for the cast iron when I'm baking, and I rarely use my old all-clad because there's not that much need for it. So I don't know if that helps. Does that make sense? That's what I would get first. And by the way, like the the wherever Lincoln's uh, Centurion line, you can get those real cheap because people don't consider them beautiful pans. They're food service pans. You can get them used on eBay. You can get lids for them. They can take a licking and keep on ticking. They are great pans, and they're not overpriced. Uh, anyway, right. make sense? Anyone? Anyone? But they're not nonstick. Right, I really do like uh, the black steel because they're more lightweight. If you need something a little lighter weight than a cast iron, and you want that non-stickness of cast iron, the black steel, the black iron, uh, thin iron pans uh, are nice uh, steel pans. Uh, anyone else have anything to add to pan land, Jordan? Yeah, you, yeah, you okay. Pan if you what? if you want a non-stick, I would just get a non-stick. If you want a non-stick, just be prepared to throw it away in three months. That's all. Because it's trash. Or use it only for the egg that you cook, like, once a week. Because it's... And, 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 make sure, and make sure you don't get... Yeah, but, I mean, like, I don't know. I feel terrible throwing away pans all the time or then using them after they aren't really non-stick anymore. When, honestly, a well-treated black steel pan is as non-stick for most things as a non-stick pan. You know? I feel like if you're using it once a week, it should last, like, six to 12 months. That's just, but that's, I don't know, to me that's crazy. Like, I have pans that I've, have been in continuous service for, like, over 30 years. And my cast iron pan was at least 60 years old when I bought it. And it's still in continuous service to this day. It just seems nuts to buy something that you know is trash. For what? Eggs don't stick to my black. When I cook eggs, I cook them in my, in my black steel. Because I don't want to wait for the cast iron to heat up. Anyway, uh, I mean, has anyone here had a, 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 um, a nonstick pan that has lasted for any length of time? No, I don't think I've ever had, I don't think I've had a nonstick pan since maybe college. Yeah, right. Now, they are a lot better than they used to be, right? I mean, that's true. I'm not going to lie and say that they haven't gotten any better. Like, for instance... It used to be that if you had birds in the house and you let your, your uh, nonstick pan overheat, all your birds would die, like instantly, dead. Because when, te- when Teflon gets what? to— Yeah. Birds yeah. down. Yeah. Tef- Throw it all, all the way. Uh, volatilizing of- Teflon is extremely toxic to birds. So as, so- as, as soon as pans get—like, this is why most people who have, like, especially parrots and other kind of, like, you know— high value birds that they care about like they don't allow teflon pans anywhere near their house nowhere near it because like one you you step away from a teflon pan like even one time and it goes over about 500 and change degrees and you start getting fumes and all your parrots fall over dead it's a nightmare here's the one that i will say though because it's like okay first of all the thing that you always hear about birds is that they live for like 800 years, you know? Mm. And so that's true. Unless you cook an egg, you overcook an egg, then they, they die. 
But I will say, just I don't want to be like a Pollyanna here. I don't want to like, oh, life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. But if your parrot dies, then you could do the yakitori after all. Uh, that's rough. People are very attached to their parrots. <laughs> People are very attached. Oh, hey, you know what we forgot to say? So Mad Sushi, the Patreon listener, we get back to it. Remember, we always eventually get back to it. Fishbowled us last week with a, uh, a sign that merely said, and I mentioned it last week, dry brining. So someday, Mad Sushi, I hope that I'm walking past your place of business and can somehow, I don't know, I don't know what, but the thing is, I don't know, like, like most people aren't set off by things like the term dry brining in the way that I am. So, like, I'm uniquely open to this sort of attack. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know. Um, Maybe you'll have to write happy sushi. It's their only character. I don't think that's going to make them mad, though. Like, why would that make them mad? You know what I mean? Anyway. Um, All right. Neurologic writes in, anyone have suggestions for a reasonable vacuum pump oil to use for food-adjacent things? Uh, I'm going to answer this right now. No. Uh... Almost all of the, uh, even the silicone-based oils that you use for vacuum pumps, um, they don't smell okay once they start kind of burning up. But I'm going to finish the rest of your question anyway. As uh, they say, I'm going to give you your time. I've had, uh, I have a few vo- rotary vane pumps that drive vacuum ovens in a vacuum distillation unit. I have a nice Welch uh, pump oil in them, but it gets fouled by moisture fairly quickly despite having a zeolite trap, which is a good. Uh, it would be great to use an oil that is more disposable, cheaper, but won't be nasty. Bonus points for something available at a brick-and-mortar store since shipping oils gets expensive. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I just go to um, – I just go to uh, – refrigeration supply i mean like in new york city there's a tons of refrigeration supply uh, places and you can just buy vacuum pump oil at them or even a lot of plumbing places have vacuum pump oil because it's just something that comes up a lot in service because a lot of us have commercial refrigeration and as everyone knows commercial refrigeration breaks constantly so you need vacuum pump oil because you need to evacuate all of the old uh refrigerant out of systems take the vacuum all the way down to zero and then often that oil gets contaminated has to be swapped out uh, but I have never had an oil, no matter what price I've paid for it, that didn't get nasty, especially once you're pumping, uh, you know, uh, moisture-laden uh, liquids through it. And uh, I don't, you know, I mean, I guess it's true I have used cheaper oils, and then you get a fog in the kitchen of oil, and that and that's no good. But I wish I could say I had a good uh, recommendation for you. Sorry. Um, S writes in, in a recent episode, Dave mentioned vacuum sealing grain for storage purposes. What sealer slash technique, uh, does he use? Uh, if this question has been answered, uh, point me towards it. It's not a very interesting technical question. Probably a one sentence answer. Well, that's not one sentence. So I, I, I use my, um, my multivac, uh, vacuum packer, right? And I bought, so they make these things for sealing mason jars, and you have to get a wide mouth lid and a regular mouth lid. And then you just, uh, you fill up the mason jar, and you put the lid but not the screw thing on, and then you stick the thing over it. And then I had to build a tube adapter to go into my vacuum pump because... The, that they don't make one. So I like it because I didn't want to do anything too complicated, even though I've been using it now for, you know, over a year, I just bored out a cork. And the best way to bore out a, uh, a rubber cork is to take a metal straw and a straight one and put it into a cordless drill and drill the metal straw through the cordless drill. If you try to use a regular drill, it's going to foul up, but the straw will clink, go right through it. And then you can shove the tube into it. And then you connect it. You just got to make sure you wet the gasket every now and again. And that's it. That's how I seal them in mason jars. And um, you know how many bugs I've gotten in my, uh, in my larder since then? None. No bugs in my larder. No bugs. Jordana's going to sign off and say goodbye. No. Goodbye, yeah, Jordana. Go. Uh, let us know when you find a supply of, uh, of uh, human meat for us to uh, put out on Patreon. Oh, I'm not finding it. I'm going to come collect it from yourself. Yeah, well, you need the, you need the growing containers and all that. You know, come I've on. got the growing. Uh, sure, sure you do. Sure you do. Sure you do. All right. Uh, thanks for coming right. on, Jordana. See you soon, I hope. Um, oh, Nate, yeah. Nate writes in. Hey, Dave, we never, did, we never did the weekly recap. What weekly recap? Oh, yeah. Like, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, everyone yeah. Did. All right. Okay. okay. I, I can tell you're bringing it up because you have something that you want to. Uh, what did you do this week, Quinn? Well, I thought I went back to basics. I remember last week I mentioned we did... Gumbo, I had a big batch of dark roux. Mm-hmm. So I tried dark roux with milk, 
kind of like the bechamel instead of uh, white roux. And then that didn't taste great on its own, but I used it as the hydration for a bread, and it turned out pretty good. Well, I was like, you used the dark roux instead of a prehydrated starch for... Yeah. Well, so you accounted for the fat, I guess, then, and, and, and didn't use fat in it? And did you notice, well, I mean, did, did, you, did, you, did you do, well, I mean, there's fat in the roux, right? Yeah, but I'm saying, like, there's not much fat in it. Again, I'm using the roux. I use, I made a, a full batch of dark roux and milk cooked together. And then I used it for m- multiple projects. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, wait, hold on. You didn't make the roux as just flour and fat and then add the milk? Or you did? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I had already made roux. Right. From last week. I am not sure what the water holding capacity of fully cooked out uh, roux is, but did you do a side by side of like regular prehydrated flour versus the roux or not? You just you say you no, like. I didn't. Yeah. You got to start doing these side by sides, man. Otherwise, how are you going to okay, know uh, whether or not you just like the bread or whether what you uh, did... I was more curious uh-huh. about the flavor impact. Well, but how do you know what the flavor impact was? Unless you were... Were you testing well, against a bread recipe that you know exactly what it tastes like? Or well, were I know you, what regular bread tastes like. Well, but did, did you follow... It's not a regular bread recipe, in other words, what I'm saying. Like, in other words, like, how do you know it's same-same? That's my point. I mean, it has a very distinct flavor. Okay. Okay. So you'd say this is something you'd try again? Yeah, I think I might say, because again, the, the thickening power is definitely not huge with such a cooked roux. I haven't tasted this yet because it's still in the freezer, but actually, I also made a roux gelato, which might be good. Right. But my point back to the bread is, unless you are using the same recipe all the time, like, how can you tell what the power of it is if you don't have all your hydrations locked in? Are you using at least the same flour base that you typically use so you know what the hydration should be? Uh, yeah, I'm using a similar uh, recipe to what I've done. All right, so here's what I'm hearing from you. What I'm hearing from you is, is that you like the flavor of it, but you need to do more work to see what its actual effect is on the functionality of the bread, other than the fact that it clearly probably tastes more like toasted stuff on the inside. Yeah, yeah, it has like a very unique, almost like natural peanut butter, almond butter, but subtle. You know, it wasn't too crazy mm. in in the bread. No. Yeah. Oh, we have a call. Uh, uh, mm, yep. Oh. Well, we got a caller. We'll, we'll come back to the root caller. You're on the air. Hey, I've got it. This is Patrick calling from, from New York City. How are you doing? All right. How are you doing? Good. Hey, the, the Rue conversation has reminded me of a long-standing question I've been meaning to ask. Is, is, is does in a, in a Rue, you know, in a traditional New Orleans, you know, uh, Louisiana-style dish, does the quality of the flour, and I'm just talking about, you know, normal white flour, mm-hmm. make any taste difference, especially as the darker it gets? Because I'm I'm always inclined to use cheapo flour for that, but I don't know if there's actually any improvement with 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 better flours. And again, I just wait. I'm, I'm you know. That's a, it's an excellent flowers. question. It's an excellent question. I I don't have. I don't think any of us have tested, so we can't say. If you asked me what my feeling is, I would say it does not matter. That's my feeling, right now. I mean, look, there's a massive difference in the water holding capacities of different flowers can be like up to like 20, 30 percent difference in water holding capacity between different flowers. So the thickening power could be different. I don't know. To be honest, I don't know how much cooking, especially to a dark stage, affects the thickening power of, let's say, so softer flowers, uh, softer wheats uh, are usually usually have much more damaged starch in them because the starch is easier. Sorry. Wait. No. 
they have less damage starch in them, so they take less water. They have less thickening power. You can add less water to them, right? Because they're soft. They're soft wheat. Harder wheats get more damaged starch, so they thicken things faster at room temperature. Once you're heating both of these things, the starch gets functionalized anyway. So I don't really know about the wa- the hot the the hot starch water holding capacity of a. Uh, um, a hard wheat versus a soft wheat. Then you add in the fact that things like whole wheat flours, right, the, the, the bran that's in that is going to absorb a lot of water cold but doesn't have a lot of hot holding capability because that bran doesn't functionalize for hot holding the way that regular starch does. So I don't have a lot of data on the thickening power of different flours. And then it's possible that even if one thickens better at a particular uh, – at a particular um, – like, you know, cold, that they won't necessarily track that way once they're both heated to dark roux stage, right? They might change differently. So there's a lot of things that I just don't know the answer to, but my guess is that it's not going to make that much of a difference. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think that this, and this is something Quinn might be be able to answer because I think he's done it. Is it, Can you pre-make roux and just free Freeze it? Oh, yeah. It uh, that's, what, that's all I do. And again, if you look, like, way, way back at, like, really old French books, it's all about you make the roux first, and it's, like, a separate thing that you utilize. So, yeah, I, I tend to make all my roux ahead of time. And, and, and you, what, what unit do you freeze it in? Like, what thought? What, I, have, your... I, I just have these, like, random... Um, Silicone molds that make like a bar shape. So I'll just freeze them there, and then I grate them with like a cheese. And so, and so, like in a gumbo style preparation, you would grate that, reheat it, and then cook like the Trinity. Why? In that, uh, why? Yeah, you, you cook, that cook, in oil you cook and the Trinity. You, I would cook the Trinity, and then uh, at least a little bit of liquid first like your stock or whatever, and then you add a first, you know, dose of roux. Why would you bother grating it? Well, no, I mean, well, no, with the soft roux, we just did a whole chunk. Yeah, but why, why would you ever grate it? Like, if, if, you're, if you don't know, if you want to use a little roux that's frozen, oh, it's a convenient way to, like, distribute it into your... And, and what, uh, what's, your, what's your preferred... Preferred fat. Again, for dark, I just did an oil. For a light roux, I'll do a regular uh, butter. Why? Interesting. Because you don't want the milk fat to darken? Yeah. Yeah, except for, I mean, I think that's part of what you get is the darkened milk solids out of that. Well, I like, uh, uh, the Louisiana style dark roux is always done with oil, from what I've seen. Right, but you're all over the map here. You're going French, you're going Louisiana. What I'm saying is, like, I think it depends on your goal, right? Yeah, I got, but I'm saying, like, when I make, I tend to make both extremes. And I, if I want somewhere in the middle, I can always, you know, mix them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hate grating. I hate grating. The only th- frozen thing I'll grate is butter for biscuits. Well, that's, this, that's the only way to make the, biscuits. The, 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 McGee, in one of the, I think it's the newer Food on Cooking, he says something offhand that I've never seen anywhere else. And I've tried it, and it's interesting. Is that he says that in Louisiana, cooks will combine different roux and different dishes for different thickening and different flavors. So, I mean, I'm not remotely an expert or even an amateur in this, but I haven't, I haven't seen it in any real live recipe or preparation. But that's sort of one of the – I'm curious to, to, to know where that came from and if anyone you know in the cooking issues community has actually seen – specific preparations with with that as well because it's always curious it's like well these taste different have different thickening powers but what if you put them together does that actually create something that's more interesting than just one of you know one of the three three shades you get to in louisiana cooking i, I don't have an answer yeah for that I, I don't have an answer either but i will say this i know for sure that every louisiana style cook i've spoken to would give all of us serious side eye on not just standing in front of the pan and stirring it forever until the roux is right. <laughs> That's well, you, for sure. Do you, well, do you have do you have a temp uh, a day for for the uh, the um, I'm blanking on the on the product the uh, 
the the control freak, which you would actually you could set it at to get darker oh, and not you know burn. I have to say it really depends on on the actual unit and how maintained mine has moved over time, so mine now registers a couple of uh, degrees lower than what the actual pan temperature is. I need to recalibrate it, so like I can't I can't really say. I do a lot of it by um, I, I don't do too much root work. Like I'd say nine times out of 10, like the thing that I praise my control freak for constantly oh. is, is onions, which is a similar sort of problem, right? You want to cook it for a long, long, mm-hmm. long time and just break it down. And usually I'm setting it at, at around, uh, Around 250, and then after it starts breaking down, I'll drop it down to about 225 in Fahrenheit and then let it go, and I don't get any real kind of like overbrowning or scorching at that. But I don't think that's going to get your roux dark in any reasonable amount of time, so you might need to I, 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 up I it. Could, I could tell you what I baked mine at as a starting point. Yeah, I mean, baking's a little different, but what do you what do, you do like uh, 275, 300, something like this? I did. I did. I did. 160 Celsius for two hours. So that's what, two? That's hot. They're 320 Fahrenheit ish. Yeah. Yeah. And then I did 175 for another t- uh, two hours. Yeah. But a lot's going to depend on the actual transfer in your oven, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, there's a lot. Yeah, there's you a can lot of do depends. it fairly, fairly fast if you're, if you're careful. Because that still seems like yeah, I mean, yeah. Time my, stuff, but, but I guess you're like it is, to pre-prep the block. Yeah, exactly. It's like I want my idea is like I'll, I'll take I'll, I'll take more time if it means I have to be less careful. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what I do with onions. I mean like and then you know well, that, now I cook them for hour. I can cook them for an hour now, which is the best. The other thing I use is my uh, I use my water pan, which I love. I love my water pan. Uh, I forget the. How do I forget the name of it? Well, I saw, I saw, I saw, I did see. Um, Kristen Petroni had some red sauce recipe where he cooked. I think it was just onions and celery for four hours before adding the tomatoes, and then did the tomatoes for four hours, which seemed kind of bonkers. But now I'm sort of curious about the super low temp. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, what, like if an hour versus four hours would make any difference. Once it goes really it long, once it goes really long, I mean, you know, what I mean? really long. But like, like for instance, uh, I've said this before, but like, uh, you know, I'll occasionally leave rice in my rice cooker for like 72 hours. At one time I left it for until it maxed out, my rice cooker maxed out. So like it was over 99 hours. And the flavor changes a little bit, but like not like a bunch, right? So like the question is, how much can you dehydrate it without scorching? And so it's a lot of dehydrate. I mean, the, the control freak is really good at taking a, a tomato sauce like down to at least half, right? So, you know, like even if you just take like decent canned tomatoes, blitz them and then take them down to half in the control freak, it's going to sputter a lot. Be careful, right? But that is delicious and it takes a while, but I don't know if you need four hours. You know what I mean? I mean, currently, my induction is is a very cheap thing that has 20, 20 degree Fahrenheit temperature intervals, which aren't particularly accurate, which is still reasonable. So, you know, yeah. I'm not dealing in you know I mean, could, one or two 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 Fahrenheit increments. I mean, the, the control freak all, so. is. I mean, like, I, I'm anxious to see how the inexpensive one works because it really. I mean, I, I it's it's a, what's it called? It's a, it's 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 really expensive, but I do use it constantly. Right. So like if, if someone were to take it away from me, I would be sad. Let's put it that way. Oh, sp- <laughs> speaking of which, did I mention that my Nova broke? Did I talk about this? No. Well, so, you, got, you told me. I, I don't think you told on the air. No. Okay. So my Nova precision oven breaks, right? Like dead. So like, okay. So I love the Innova. I've said this a million times. The main problem with it is, is it's, it's, it's too big to run off of a 110 socket. It doesn't have enough power really to do everything it's supposed to do. Uh, but if you can get around that and it doesn't have the kind of juice that a real combi has in terms of its ability to really hit the, hit the accelerator, then like it's an awesome piece of equipment. But much like a lot of the stuff that we work on, like it's a little bit beta, right? So, um, in other words, beta, you know, like it needs a, a little work. So one of the issues I have with it, obviously, anytime anyone cleans the front of it, 
uh, it turns off or on. And if you have glove, because it's got those weird capacitive sensors on the thing, and you, and if you're using gloves to take things in and out of the APO, you can't turn the oven off with your gloves on, which sucks, right? The other thing that really ticks me off about the Anova is that the the racks that are in it aren't sturdy enough so that, uh, or, or the indents in the oven that hold the racks aren't deep enough such that if you stick something really heavy, like a big La Crusade, La Crusade uh, pot full of stuff, boom, the rack just falls to the bottom of the oven. If you're lucky, you don't spill it all over the inside of the oven. So those are two of the main things. But the, the coating on the inside of the uh, door went south on me. And started rusting. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to ignore this problem. Like, the paint chipped and started rusting on the inside because it's not stainless. It's, it's, it's just painted metal. I'm going to ignore this problem. And then all of a sudden, oven wouldn't turn off one day. Wouldn't turn off. So I was like, oh, my God. So, like, I had to unplug the oven to turn it off, which is not something you want to have to do. I opened it up, and I had to unscrew the door. I take the whole thing apart. When I take it apart, I realize that they've had these wires because they have the—, the the door has the controls on it. There's these wires that go into the door. And after the time, open, close, open, close, open, close. Boom, the wires, bye-bye, broken, right? So I was like, oh, my God. And then when I did it, I saw the, how much rust there was on the inside of the door. I couldn't put the, the front, the, the glass back in it anymore because it was so rusted. I put navel jelly on it, which is, you know, what you use to get rid of rust. And it was so bad that I put my finger straight through the door. So I had to then, like, patch that. And then the silicone, I uh, repainted it all with Krylon barbecue paint and then clear coat. And then I bought a bunch of really high temp silicone. I re-soldered all the wires and like coated them up and put it. So I got it back together again. But I would say no one but someone who knows how to build something could have fixed it. And you can't buy the door. You can't just buy the door. Anyway, so I have an oven again, but trials and tribulations. But you know what, though? For 700 bucks or whatever they sell it for, you, there's nothing comparable. So I'm, it's not like I don't recommend getting it. It's just have your eyes open. You know what I'm saying? Anyway. Uh, all right. Uh, Nate uh, says, your Thai basil daiquiri is one of my favorite drinks. Had it one time at uh, XCon and blender muddled them at home. My wife, my wife chooses not to drink much, but will either have a sip of mine or have me pour her a tiny glass. What would your recommendation be for trying to create a low alcohol version? We guess that you uh, could denature the enzymes with a relatively small amount of rum. If you could make it work mechanically, maybe a food processor instead of a blender, then top it with a non-alcoholic rum and finish the drink. Or this could be a reason to work a little harder for some uh, LN for nitro muddling. It's an interesting question, Nate. I mean, it'll stay somewhat fresh for uh, a little bit of time. I would say, you know, my typical thing when I reduce alcohol is um, you need to add some form of bodying agent other than sugar. So my, like, and I don't, I, you know, fair notice, I don't use a lot of the pre-made non-alcoholic uh, spirits. I don't know kind of what's in them, but the two things that I use are glycerin and polydextrose. Polydextrose, uh, you can add like a, uh, make a 50-50 polydextrose uh, simple syrup and add that, and it adds no sweetness uh, at all, but it does add the same body as the equivalent amount of sugar. So you, you know, you can completely jack it with polydextrose and get some of that uh, texture back. When the cocktails get very low alcohol on a shaken side, I tend to want to add a foaming agent to it. So you might want to add like uh, get one of the commercial foaming agents or like go look at someone's recipe for like a methocell F50. So it's going to be F like Frank 50 methocell uh, like uh, liquid. And usually it's going to be a mixture of F50 with a little bit of xanthan gum and maybe some depending on gum Arabic, depending on which formulation people are using. But that's going to add some foaminess. And I find that in low alcohol shaken drinks, the only way to really make it feel like a, a drink because it doesn't hold the air the same way is to go all the way into kind of the, the, the fluffy side. Uh, almost like an egg white texture. And that's going to make it kind of more satisfying. It doesn't solve the problem that you're having, that you're worried it's going to oxidize, but um, it does kind of make the drink um, taste a little more like a real cocktail for shaking drinks. Because shaking drinks are hard to make both low and non-alcoholic. Easier low and harder non. That uh, that makes sense, folks? Was that making any sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Rob has hobbies rights in and wants to know about kakigori ice and cocktails. Any standout bills to try? Any new thoughts on modified ice such as coconut water? Thinking of shaved frozen, frozen coconut water with a banana stino. That sounds good. Um, I've only ever used regular ice uh, in my in my shave ice and. I tend not to, so, like, for those of you that don't know, like, the kakigori style, like, there's actually ice left over when you're done, and so, you know, the only way to do that is to put kind of the alcohol in the bottom of the drink and then build a lot of shaved ice on top of it. Uh, that's not the, you know, and then the stuff you pour on it, like syrup and all of that, doesn't melt the 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 ice nearly as much as alcohol does, right? Mm-hmm. So I've never done a... I've never done a drink that shows uh, up at the table not almost fully melted. So, like, my style of doing it doesn't really lend itself to that, so I don't have any experience with it. So, I, you know, the way I do it is I put some in the glass, I shave until you have a nice big pile, I take it to the table, I pour the the rest of the liquid on the top, and it instantly melts down into the coop and forms almost what is like a blender drink, but higher alcohol than a standard blender drink. Uh, so I don't have any experience. If you can get a good shave out of, like, uh, coconut water, that's great. I don't have a lot of experience with it because I like a very specific kind of shaved ice, and so usually ices that have flavors in them don't shave as nicely. And they chum up. They're fine, like, if that's what you want, but they chum up. They don't have the same kind of amazing texture in my mind that uh the straight shaved ices so i don't wish i had more wish i had more information for you um math man writes in i love red wine vinegar on sandwiches and hate how low viscosity it is doesn't everyone math man you don't want that stuff to soup out yeah. although the real hoagie lovers know that you want that like oil and vinegar on it. it's not the same without it which is why when you buy one of those things and ship it if if the, if the places were a spit they'll package it separately they'll put the meat and cheese and two pieces of paper on the inside of the bread and hand you the containers with the with the oil and the vinegar separately so that you make it when you get home right i mean come on uh, anyway, uh, it makes the bread all soggy and drips everywhere. Mayo coating on the bread reduces sogginess, but it's still a mess. Uh, how would you uh, best thicken vinegar to make it cling? Would you use xanthan or uh, modified cornstarch or guar? I mean, xanthan is going to work. Uh, the problem with xanthan is, is that you, know, you don't want it to get too snotty. You're not going to use it in that high of a quantity. I mean, you could easily with – I mean, in other words, you could easily make it spreadable, right? You could make the vinegar spreadable. Uh, but I wouldn't use straight xanthan for it. I wonder, I have to think about what I would use. I mean, you don't want what to... About a, what about a little plain extra in there? Well, it's just going to make it... It's, it's going to make it simple syrup. It's going to make it like simple syrup, right? So it's going to... Uh, it doesn't have an extraordinarily high viscosity. So it depends on... If all you're looking to do is make it a little bit thicker, if you want to make it, like I say, if you want to make it spreadable, right then you're going to have to like fairly well thicken it. But if you were going to thicken it, you would want to thicken it with something that doesn't need to be heated, right? And it's going to mm-hmm. re- it's going to reduce the flavor release of it if you use, let's say, I don't know how well ultra spurs will respond, and you're going to want to use spurs, not tex. I don't know how well mm-hmm. something like ultra spurs is going to respond to something that's that acidic just because I've never done it, right? Now, what you could do, if you don't want to heat it, here's something you could do. You want to make something really spreadable. Now, you're going to have to use like twice as much as you ordinarily would. But if you make a very thick uh, agar, like like 2-3%, right, you boil it, and then whoosh, add the vinegar to that and then let it set down, that will set. You could blend that into a fluid gel, and then <laughs> you could have a spreadable kind of uh, fluid gel. You want to end up at like half a percent or so of agar when you're, when you're done. And it should be able to handle a fairly high acidity. I've done it with pretty acidic lemon. I don't, can't remember whether I've done it with vinegar or not. Uh, and I don't remember what the pH limits on gel and gum are. But maybe a fluid gel is the way to go. Yeah, it's got pretty good flavor release. You, you you that much what? <laughs> Yeah, you know, on the Patreon, it took a forum, so people can't respond. Agar fluid gel is exactly what uh, Kevin suggested. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Agar fluid gel, baby. I, you know, everyone like goes for like all like the fancy folks like Wiley, my brother in law. They all go for gel in because they have a lot around. But there's a lot to be said for agar just because it's so easy to buy. So when I can recommend something like agar that you can just go to your local, uh, you know, store and buy, I do. You know what I'm saying? I buy the telephone. Would gelatin hold up or no? No. 
acidic. Oh, and no, it's not that. It's just you won't. How are you gonna? I mean, you can set it, but you can't make a fluid gel with gelatin. There you go. What? It doesn't hold. It doesn't re. It doesn't have the same texture as like an agar fluid gel. Go agar. Do agar. Mm-hmm. Agar. Agar is agar is an awesome thing. Uh, L Butts writes in. Curious as to whether magnesium carbonate is still the best method for clarifying starchy liquids, uh, e.g. ginger juice. Quinn alluded to in the past that there's a new method Dave was using. Wondering if uh, that method is uh, – what's, what's OPSEC? Is that like top secret? OPSEC? I, I don't know. Yeah. Don't uh, or it. can be explained. Um, <laughs> having source, uh, trouble sourcing food-grade magnesium carbonate within Australia. By the way, I might go to Australia. Is that still happening? Am I still maybe going to go to Australia in September? Uh, it's in the works. Mm. Uh, I actually have a lot of travel coming up, right? I'm going to Australia, going to Rochester soon. We have Brooklyn Bar Conference coming up. Tales of the Cocktail pretty Maybe soon. Maybe Korea. Maybe <laughs> Korea, we'll see. Uh, I know Modernist Pantry has a magnesium carbonate, but a significant delivery fee. Uh, would love to know about it. Okay, here's the problem. Um, oh my God, hold a second. Also might want to explain the uh, stars. You ready for, to get triggered? I don't know, what is it? All right. Get ready. Trigger warning for Nastasia Lopez. Also, you might want to explain to uh, the, the Spinzol 2.0 to Dave Chang. He plugged in a 2.0 on a recent episode of his podcast and called it a rotovap. I had a little giggle. How that? Are you okay? Are you triggered? <laughs> that should trigger you like pretty it's, hard. It doesn't trigger me. I don't care what people say about me. Yeah, you know, but I don't These know. Are business. All right. That, that's what I'm saying. You're, you know, anyway, that's funny. Um, so listen, L, uh, when you're doing ginger, most of the work can be done just by adding a little bit of acidity to it along with the enzymes and then it drops and you can get like 80% of the yield because ginger, if you treat it right with the, with the enzymes and the wine finding agents, it drops real hard. So like if you have a lot of experience clarifying, something like Granny Smith apple juice drops real hard and ginger drops real hard. Remember, you have to do it with the alcohol. If you don't do it with the alcohol, it doesn't taste as spicy. So that's what I do for the most of it. And then to get the last little bit clear, then I'll do the magnesium carbonate. The problem with magnesium carbonate is, is it's not one thing, right? If you can find the fluffy magnesium carbonate, then it's fluffy. If you buy it, it's not that expensive. So just buy whatever you get in Australia. If it's super, super fluffy, if like a two pound bag is the size of like a 10 pound bag of rice, then you got the right stuff. If like two pounds fits into like, you know, something the size of a, of a small sugar bag, then it's the wrong stuff. It's too, it's too dense uh, and it won't work. Uh, was that enough of an answer, Quinn? Yeah, I think so. All right. Uh, another one from math, man, uh, Dave, all of your opinions on how to make delicious fries at home. What do you think of adding vinegar to the parboil water to provide flexibility to the fries to prevent their breaking? Ethan Chelbowski seems to do it, uh, to some cess, but I don't see it replicated in many places. Although Kenji talks about it back in 2010, which with his McDonald's fry recipe, which by the way, if you want to read about an earlier thing, you can read my writing about it in 2008. Boom. Boom! Uh, yeah, no, I, I've done vinegar. I used to do vinegar fries back uh, then. Heston used to say he, he did. You, here's the issue is that um, it tastes good and they cook forever. You can go look at the old cooking issues section where I talk. I, I believe I didn't we write about that, Stas, Vin, doing the fr- vinegar fries like we used to do all the time? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah so it is viable, but it's, it's a pain because... It's like you use a lot of vinegar, and then it smells like vinegar, and then, you know, the outsides cook, but the insides don't, so they get kind of beat up. But it tastes good, and people like them, and they ended up being pretty crunchy. I like it. I would try it. Uh, But go check out uh, what I said about it back, you know, I don't know, 12 years, 13, 14, whatever. How many years ago we did it? 14 years ago, because uh, it was much more fresh in my mind back then than it is uh, now. Uh, all right. So, uh, what else we got? Uh, Jack, did you do anything this week? You didn't tell me what you did this week. I know what Estasia did. She flew uh, all the way from no. LA over to here. Nothing good? Yeah. No, nothing good. Here. Yeah, 56 but seconds be, uh, to come up by. Good dinner tonight, so. Well, you're going out with the inimitable Jessica Harris, who was a guest on this show. Uh, and, you know, everyone knows who Jessica Harris is. So, hopefully, you'll have some good stories. Bring it back next week. We have another All Tangent Tuesday, I believe, next week. Is that correct, Quinn? Uh, no, it depends. Uh, I'll talk after. 
So who knows? Next week, maybe no tangents, maybe all tangents, maybe a guest. We'll find out. Cooking issues. <laughs>